Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. So welcome to this edition of Michael Brown Unplugged. I want to get started with the story that I, I don't think is getting enough attention. It's a story that appeared in the Washington Post over the Memorial Day weekend. And I, quite frankly, I think this is a story that ought to get incredibly wide publication, wide dissemination, but nobody's going to talk about it. Talk about it. Here's the headline. The Statue of Liberty was created to celebrate freed slaves, not immigrants, its new museum recounts. Now, I remember it's been maybe uh, a couple of weeks ago. CBS Sunday Morning, you know that I'm a I'm an avid fan of CBS Sunday Morning, and I know that it tends to sometimes lean left. But if you're looking for a good program that's kind of a news magazine that's more about culture, and it's just it's it's kind of devoid of politics, although occasionally some of the people they interview swerve into politics because we live in a society now where everything has to be infused with politics. But nonetheless, if, if you're looking for something that is generally 99% non-politics and you're willing to recognize that some of the people that they interview are going to be leaning left a little bit, then CBS Sunday Morning is a show to you is a show for you to watch before you go to, to Sunday school or to church on Sunday mornings. I've been watching it since Charles Kuralt. Remember Charles Kuralt and how he would get in the van and he would go across America? Well, I've been watching this program ever since then, and I'm just addicted to it. And when I can't watch it, I normally DVR it so I can watch it later. But anyway, a couple of weeks ago, maybe longer, I don't remember, they did a story about the new museum that was opening up on Liberty Island for the Statue of Liberty. And it caught my eye because it was just interesting to hear some of their side of the story, at least, about uh, Lady Liberty and the statue and its history and the reason they had created the museum, the cost of the museum, what they were trying to accomplish, and, and, and really an effort to kind of reduce some of the wear and tear that the Statue of Liberty is experiencing because so many people who travel to, particularly if you, if you travel to Lower Manhattan, and you were there to see Ground Zero, and you're there to see the uh, the museum for the 9-11 atrocities, you are more likely than not going to get on a ferry, and you're going to go over, and you're going to see the Statue of Liberty. You're at least going to walk to the shore. You're at least going to walk out to the ferry uh, landing, and, and you're going to look at the Statue of Liberty. So, but whether you go or not, the Statue of Liberty is is experiencing a lot of wear and tear, and so they've created this great new museum. The museum obviously is on the on Liberty Island. It's in New York Harbor, and it boasts a lot of treasures. It has the original torch. It has that was replaced back in the 1980s. It has an unoxidized, meaning it hasn't turned green yet, copper replica of Lady Liberty's face, and it has recordings of immigrants describing the site of the 300-foot monument the first time they saw it, where. Whether they were coming from uh, Western Europe, they were coming from uh, Ireland, they were coming from the United Kingdom, as they came into New York Harbor and they started going through Ellis Island, a lot of these recordings are of immigrants describing the first time they saw the monument. Now, the monument also revives an aspect of the statue's long-forgotten history. You see, the Statue of Liberty was originally designed to celebrate the end of slavery, not the arrival of the immigrants. Now, Ellis Island, which is the inspection point through which these millions of immigrants passed, didn't open until six years after the statue was unveiled in 1886. Now, after the statue was unveiled, and many years later, the famous Emma Lazarus poem, you know, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That was not even added until 1903. Now, remember, the statue was unveiled in 1886. So not until some 17 years later was the poem added to the base of the statue. Now, according to Edward Berenson, who is a history professor at New York University and the author of the book, the Statue of Liberty, a transatlantic story, 
did an interview with the Washington Post. And the first quote he says, the first important quote anyway, is this. One of the first meanings of the statue had to do with abolition, but it's a meaning that didn't stick. The meaning celebrating the abolition of slavery didn't stick. So what happened? The monument, which draws about 5 million visitors a year, was first imagined by a man named Edward de Labellou in France. He was an expert on the U.S. Constitution, and at the close of the American Civil War, the president of a committee that raised and disbursed funds to newly freed slaves, according to Yasmin Sabina Khan, author of the book Enlightening the World, The Creation of the Statue of Liberty, Labellou loved America so much that he often gave speeches described by a New York Times correspondent in 1867 as, quote, feasts of liberty, which move the souls of men to their deepest depths. And he loved it even more when slavery was abolished. So in June of 1865, Labellou organized a meeting of French abolitionists at his summer home in Versailles. There, according to this professor, they talked about the idea of creating some kind of commemorative gift that would recognize the importance of the liberation of the slaves. Now, so far, everything about the historic origins of the Statue of Liberty have nothing to do with immigration, but have everything to do with the freedom of slaves. So, Labellou secured the partnership of a sculptor, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, who took his sweet time developing this idea. There was an early model around 1870 that showed Lady Liberty with her right arm in the position that we're familiar with, raised and illuminating the world with a torch. But in her left hand, in this original sculpture, she was holding broken shackles, clearly an homage to the end of slavery. Now, there's a terracotta model of the original idea of the Statue of Liberty that still resides in the Museum of the City of New York. Now, there's this theory going around that has her face being adapted from a statute that Bar- Bar- Bartholdi, Bartholdi had proposed for the Suez Canal, meaning that her visage could resemble that of an Egyptian woman. Now, the New York Times reported that, at the time, that she was based on the Roman goddess Libertas, who typically wore the type of cap worn by freed Roman slaves. Are you getting, are you kind of getting the, the drift here? That going back to the historical or, origins, can I just add a parenthetical real quickly? Everywhere you turn and every opportunity that you see where people are trying to erase our history, This is why they're trying to do it. Because once you erase history, it is so able to imprint upon people whatever belief system you want to impose upon them because they have nothing with which to gauge what you're imprinting them with. So in this case, the Statue of Liberty, originally designed both in concept and in design, was to celebrate the abolition of slavery. It wasn't to celebrate immigrants. Now in the final model, The statue holds a tablet inscribed with the Roman numerals for July 4, 1776. Now, the broken chains are still there, though, but they're, and nobody ever looks, but they're at the bottom of her feet. They're not really that visible, according to the professor. A close-up of part of the chains at the Statue of Liberty can be seen if you find the right photograph. Now, Bartoldi made a number of trips to the United States to whip up support for the colossal structure according to the National Park Service. And sailing into New York Harbor, he spotted what he thought was the perfect location to put this statue, Bedloe's Island. It was then occupied by the crumbling Fort Wood. So he started fundraising both in France and the United States. It took a while, according to the National Park Service. He cast the project in the broadest terms possible to widen the the net of potential supporters that he could call upon to raise the money to actually start casting the statue. He also built the torch-bearing arm 
to tour around and inspire people to create uh, or to open up their wallets. He, he was doing everything he could to raise money to actually mold and cast this statue and bring it to the United States. Now, he finished building the statue in Paris in 1884. Two years later, he oversaw the reconstruction of the statue in New York. Obviously, you couldn't lay on its side or do anything, so they had to take it apart in Paris and then ship it across to New York Harbor. By then, by the time he actually got it up and unveiled on October 28, 1886, not a really big deal at the time. There was some fireworks. There was a military parade, and there's, there's Bartholdi climbing to the top and pulling a French flag from his muse's face. By then... The original meaning of the abolition of slavery had pretty much gotten lost, according to Professor Berenson. In fact, black newspapers railed against the statue as meaningless and hypocritical. Then you get to 1886. Reconstruction had been crushed. The Supreme Court had rolled back civil rights protections. And now Jim Crow laws were tightening their grip on the South and other parts of the country. So let's go back to Professor Berenson's book. He quotes an 1886 editorial in the black newspaper, the Cleveland Gazette. Here's what he says. Shove the Bartoli statue, torch, and all into the ocean until the liberty of this country is such as to make it possible for an industrious and inoffensive colored man in the South to earn a respectable living for himself and his family. The idea of the liberty of this country enlightening the world, or even Patagonia, is ridiculous in the extreme. Oh, he was ticked off. He was really ticked off because his original meaning for the statute, meaning that we had fought the Civil War, Lincoln had freed the slaves, we had fought the war over slavery, abolition, the abolitionists had won, the slaves had been freed. He was ecstatic, only to see... America backslide, Jim Crow laws, the crush of Reconstruction, all of that. He was really ticked off. Now, W.E.B. Dubois, also mentioned in his autobiography, recalled seeing the statue upon arriving back in the United States back in 1894 after two years in Europe. And Dubois wrote, I know not what multitude of emotions surged in the others, But I had to recall a mischievous little French girl whose eyes twinkled as she said, Oh yes, the Statue of Liberty, with its back toward America and its face toward France. Now, there were immigrants on board that ship with Dubois, but he didn't talk to any of them. Now, why would Dubois not talk to anybody on the ship as they sailed into New York Harbor? Because the ship was segregated. And now you know the rest of the story. The Statue of Liberty is not immigration. The Statue of Liberty is about the abolition of slavery. That's the original intent. That's the original purpose. And if you don't know the history of the Statue of Liberty, then you're going to fall prey to everybody that reads that the, the Emma Lazarus poem about, you know, give me your huddled masses yearning to be free. If you take her poem in light of or in the context of the original purpose of the Statue of Liberty, then you understand that it is not about a beacon of anybody and everybody without any limitation coming to this country, but instead it is a beacon about liberty and freedom, and in particular, the liberty and freedom of the black man in this country. That's the original purpose of the Statue of Liberty. So the next time somebody tells you, oh, but the Statue of Liberty, it's got its torch, she has her torch held high in the sky. And the poem below says, give me your huddled masses yearning to be free. And they claim that that means that we should be welcoming to all immigrants. That's simply not the history of the statue. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be open arms to immigrants. We should be open arms to immigrants, but we should have an immigration system that says if you want to come and reap the benefits of living in the land of the free and the home of the brave, then you have to take responsibility. 
You can't be a drain on social services. You can't come here with diseases. You can't become a ward of the state. You can't live off the government teat. You have to become a productive member of society. So that's my that's my screed about immigration. But never forget the original purpose of the Statue of Liberty. Nothing to do with immigration and everything to do with the abolition. You may or may not have heard over the weekend that the uh, a lot of countries in Europe had their European Union elections. And it's a mixed bag. And the mixed bag is pretty much that the nationalists won in some countries, uh, the Green Party won in other countries. In fact, in some countries, both the nationalists and the, uh, the, Green, the Green Party both came away with pluralities, meaning that they're going to have to figure out a way to form coalition governments. That's pretty much the downfall, I think, of parliamentary systems as opposed to a democratic republic like we have. Well, German Chancellor Angela Merkel her favored successor, Annegret Kramp Karrenbauer. I'm sorry for bastardizing the name, but I, my German's not very good. Apparently, this successor or this favored successor to Angela Merkel stirred a lot of outrage on social media last week with an apparent call for limits to free speech around elections. The CDU chief's comment, that's the party she represents, came after her party and its center-left coalition partner, the SPD, suffered their worst scores in Sunday's European election, a result partly blamed on the fact that some 70, just 7-0, 70 YouTube stars had urged Germans not to vote for either party. So what did they do? Well, they went to the press on Monday night and said that if 70 newspaper editors had called to boycott parties ahead of an election, that would be classed, quote, clearly as propaganda. Now I want you to compare and contrast that in the United States, because we're coming up on an election pretty soon. It's going to be here sooner than you think. And in that election, newspapers are going to editorialize both for and against candidates, issues, parties, you name it. But in Germany, in the European Union, you don't have that freedom of the press. I'll tackle this discussion quite aggressively, said Kramp Karrenbauer, or AKK as she's been dubbed in Germany. That's easier for me, AKK. That's Angela Merkel's uh, preferred, favored successor. Now her comments that I'm going to I'm going to tackle this discussion quite aggressively sparked a storm on social, social media. Many users pointed to Article 5 in the German Constitution guaranteeing freedom of opinion, speech, and writing. The German Federation of Journalists also hit out against AKK's call, calling it, quote, not just nonsense, but also a violation of the Constitution. But here's what you and I need to recognize about this. This is the willingness of progressives. This is the willingness of, of, of fascists that are clothed in progressive politics, no longer fearing to express themselves about what their real intent are, their, their real intent is. According to one YouTuber, this is absurd. Nobody would get upset if an actor or an athlete made an election recommendation. But AKK later tried to downplay her comments, saying it was ridiculous to insinuate that I want to regulate expressions of opinion. She said, freedom of opinion is a precious value in democracy when it suits them. When you have YouTubers that come out and oppose you just because that's on social media, somehow they believe that they can regulate that. That's why... And I know that I'm schizoid. I I am absolutely schizophrenic when it comes to social media platforms. I think they're, I think they are big enough that they could be subject to antitrust laws, but I don't want government regulation. If you don't like Facebook, get off Facebook. If you don't like Twitter, get off Twitter. I don't like either one of them, but I use them and I use them for my, for my own purposes. 
Now, the 70 YouTubers called a vote against this particular uh, particular political party was a follow-up to an hour-long video rant from another online star named Rezo, who blamed the center-right-led coalition for failing to tackle poverty and climate change. You think I'm schizo about social media? The European Union right now is completely schizo. And the resignation of Theresa May as Prime Minister in the United Kingdom shows one very point that I think politicians in this country ought to consider. If the people say, we want X done, and you keep farting around, not doing it, in other words, not doing Brexit, not leaving the European Union, there'll be hell to pay. And I think in the upcoming parliamentary elections in the United Kingdom, you're going to see, you won't necessarily see the Tories, which is the Conservative Party, you won't necessarily see them win, but I think what we will see, I think we'll see the Brexit Party, Nigel Farage and his party, maybe Boris Johnson, I I think you'll see them win a majority in the British Parliament. And that is nothing more than a singular substantive rebuke of the failure to do what the people asked them to do. Maybe someday in this country, we'll start standing up to the politicians. Or we might just uh, turn into Iran. You know, dumbasses might be less sympathetic toward Islam if they realize that its victory in the 1,400-year-old war it has been waging against Western civilization would mean that even yoga might be illegal. I don't know whether it's goat. Well, I I suppose it's not. (laughs) I suppose it's not goat yoga in Iran, or maybe it is goat yoga. It's certainly not canine yoga, but I don't know whether canine yoga is a thing or not. Here's the story. Roughly 30 individuals taking part in a private yoga session were detained in Iran. The people were arrested in the northern city of Gorgon, where they were apparently taking part in a mixed class. Now, before we get to the rest of the story, let's stop and think about this. So you got a private group of people. You have uh, mixed genders. I'm, I'm going to assume in Iran you only have male and female because Iran is not nearly as advanced as we are, where we have, what, 30 plus genders? So you have a a private group of people, 30 individuals, taking part in a private yoga session, and they were detained because they were in a mixed class. And you know in yoga you get all that bending over and you got the tight leggings. and Well, I can just imagine. So I'm kind of glad that – and what I think about – look, I I shouldn't make fun of yoga because if I tried to make some of those moves and bend over, I'd never make it back home. Mixed sports, you see, are banned in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Local Justice Department official Masad Salamani, or Salmonella, I don't know, said the instructor, who was also arrested, had no license to run the class. You see, they are becoming American. You got to have a license to have a private yoga gathering in your own home. He also said that those taking part, were wearing inappropriate clothing and had behaved abnormally. Well, okay, so, yeah, inappropriate clothing. You ever seen a fat guy wearing tights, Mm, spandex? Yeah, I think that might be inappropriate clothing, too. And behave abnormally? Look, I think all that bending and stretching and everything, I think that's abnormal. I have a hard enough time just pick. How how many of you just don't even bend over to pick up a penny on the street anymore? Yeah, because it's just too much trouble, right? Now, these people are actually risking their lives by going to a home to put themselves in all of these bizarre, you know, configurations, uh, and then they get in trouble. And they don't have a license to do it. Oh, love America, right? He also said that those taking part were wearing inappropriate clothing and had behaved abnormally and that the security forces, oh, thank goodness for the security forces, had been monitoring the home for some time before the arrest, according to the Tasman News Agency. You know, Islamizing, Islamizing the West is going to be a messy business. Imagine jailing everybody who who behaves abnormally in a place like, I don't know, San Francisco, in a place like Denver, 
Hell's Bells in a place like almost anywhere in the United States, if we're going to start arresting people for behaving abnormally or wearing inappropriate clothing, um, why don't we just get the people that wear the wife beaters and the, and the flip-flops on the airplanes? How about that? I could go for that right there. Eliminate that right now. Bernie Sanders is all upset. Bernie Sanders has gotten so extreme that he's actually scaring liberal New York publications. The malevolent radicalism of Bernie Sanders has begun to alarm even New York publications. This is from New York Magazine. A week ago, the New York Times reported on Bernie Sanders' 1980s vintage foreign policy stands, which at times crossed over from mere opposition to American policy to outright support for communist governments. Sanders initially refused to speak with the reporters, but after the article appeared, he called one of them and gave an extremely crusty interview. Well, that's because he's a crusty old fart. What do you expect? Now, back in the 1980s, most Democrats opposed Reagan's support for the Contras, but they actually stopped short of supporting the communist Sandinistas who ruled Nicaragua. Bernie didn't stop short. No, Bar- Bar- Bernie didn't stop short. Bernie's full bore communist. The story continues. The Times shows that Sanders went well beyond mere opposition to funding the war. He wrote to Sandinista leaders that American news media had not, quote, reflected fairly the goals and accomplishments of your administration. On a visit to the country, he attended a Sandinista celebration at which the crowd crowd chanted, Here, there, everywhere, the Yankees will die and complained that American reporters ignored the truth about Nicaragua's government, telling a CBS reporter, you are worms. Now, not even the people who gave us Dan Rather deserve to be called worms by Bernie Sanders. Instead of claiming that he's no longer a radical who supports communist dictatorships against his own country, you know, I find it funny. i got to stop for a second. Don't you find it funny? Everybody keeps telling us how Donald Trump's a dictator, that Donald Trump loves the Ruskies, and the Ruskies, by the way, are communists, so therefore, I guess Donald Trump loves communism. They they keep screaming that at the top of their lungs when there is no evidence to that whatsoever. But here you have a guy running for president who got deep six by Hillary Clinton in the Clinton machine, who's now in a neck-and-neck tie with Joe Biden, who absolutely claims to be a communist. So instead of claiming that he's no longer a radical that supports communist dictatorships against his own country, Bernie Sanders, the guy who had a Soviet flag on his office wall at the height of the Cold War, attacked reporter Sidney Ember for bringing up his extremism. Here's a quote from that crusty interview. Ember, the reporter, you do recall hearing those chants. I think the Wire report has them saying, here, there, everywhere, the Yankees will die. To which Bernie Sanders responds, they were fighting against American, uh, 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 yes, what, what, what is your point? Well, the point, Bernie, Bernie, is that you're a dumbass. And you, some might even say you're a treasonous snake. So here's confirmation of that. Sanders continues in the interview. Of course there was an anti-American sentiment there. This was a war being funded by the United States against the people of Nicaragua. Yeah, by the people of Nicaragua, he means the repressive communist regime that was grinding the people of Nicaragua under its heel, under its, under its thug boots. See how snide this Okami can get? Let's go back to the reporter. Ember asks, Do you think if you had heard that directly, meaning the chant, here, there, everywhere, the Yankees will die, do you think you would have stayed at the rally? To which Sanders replies, You know, I think, Sidney, with all due respect, you don't understand a word that I'm saying. Well, of course not, because communists are so much smarter than the people who ever question them. And in fact, the people who question communists are just stupid because, well, they're going to end up in the gulag or end up dead somewhere. But I'll tell you one thing very, very easy to understand is this. A vote for Bernie Sanders would be a despicable act of vandalism against the United States and everything this country stands for. And the fact that he's number two in the polling, now I know it's early, but number two in the polling right now behind Joe Biden should tell you something about, well, tell you about the Democrats. 
Now, it's not as if, just moving right along, because I, I got things to do here, right? I'm still at the undisclosed location, and I got, I got a hike to take, so I got to finish this podcast. It isn't as if Americans lack the, the physical capacity con- to construct a border wall to defend their land from foreign invaders. If you just get the dysfunctional big government out of the way, the job might actually be finished in no time. Now, I've got mixed emotions about this, and they're going to run into some problems when they these people who are trying to build the private, privately build the wall between the United States and Mexico. They're going to have some problems when they run into government land. They're not going to be able to build on government land without doing all the environmental impact statements, all the EISs, without getting permission from the government, which the government's not going to give them, or when they run into a ranch owner that's just going to be like, no, I'm not willing to give up that much of my land to build a wall unless you, you know, pay me. In what might be seen, the story reports, as a Memorial Day gift to President Trump, residents of a mountain range outside of El Paso today woke up to a new vista, a mile-long wall of metal slats constructed along the border with Mexico that just shot up over the weekend. The secret project, which started on Friday evening, was completed by Monday morning. Well, now we know it was a private project because I don't know. Name, Come on, here, name me. I've got all the time in the world. Name me a government project that starts on a Friday evening and is finished by Monday morning. Oh, I'll wait. I can just hit pause on the record button, and I can just sit here in my little studio at the undisclosed location all day long until you come up with a successful 48-hour government program. The secret project, which started on Friday evening and was completed by Monday morning, was the work of We Build the Wall, a new group whose director is the former White House strategist Steve Bannon. Oh, no. That's bad news because Steve Bannon's crazy, right? Isn't he one of those alt-right figures or whatever that's supposed to be? The CEO is Air Force veteran Brian Colfage, who has raised $20 million to build the wall through his GoFundMe project, but it, it appeared to be floundering until Bannon took the, ram, the, the reins. Now, if only people like that were at the helm of Congress, rather than conspiring Democrats and their enablers on the Republican side, we might actually get something done along the southern border. But here's what fascinates me. The, my, the, the one mile of that wall only cost $6 million. Now, build enough of it, it would pay for itself in a matter of days when you consider the staggering cost of illegal immigration. $6 million. You can't build a mile of highway for $6 million. <laughs> I don't care what you do. So congratulations to the, uh, to the, to the We Build the Wall group. You got a mile of, of, of border wall up. Uh, good luck with the rest of it. I hope you're able to do it. Uh, you know, I've talked a lot about. No, hang on, hang, hang on a second. I, I got to take a sip of Diet Coke. Okay, I'm back. So, you know, I've talked a lot about transgenderism and how I think it's an example of. For example, in yesterday's podcast, we talked about the new Gillette ad that has a transgender woman who is now shaving her face for the first time, and Gillette's making a big deal out of that. And I don't get it. I, and I don't get it, as I said yesterday, because. What's the market share that Gillette is going about? I mean, the number of people who are or who are transgendering from female to male has to be infinitesimal in terms of the of the market share and the number of razor blades and razor handles and shaving cream that Gillette sells. But nonetheless, they want to do the the sort of um, Virtue signaling that these companies think is so important to somehow, I guess, to placate the larger segment of the market share that they already have, that they think they're going to keep buying razor blades. Oh, yeah, because now they're selling razor blades to transgender. And I never understand. If, if it's a man going to a woman or a woman going to a man, as in the case of the Gillette ad, is that considered a transgender man or a transgendered woman? Because, well, you know, I I don't get it. But anyway, the point being this. Gender dysphoria, and I told you this would happen, and it's going to happen slowly but surely. Gender dysphoria is switching from what is considered to be a mental health disease to a right. The United Nations 
usually seems useless for any sort of constructive purpose, in my opinion. But its agency, the World Health Organization, has just achieved an astounding feat. It has cured the severe form of mental illness that reduced Olympic hero Bruce Jenner to a freakish laughingstock. This was ingeniously accomplished by declaring that gender dysphoria is no longer a disease, but is now a human right. So let's go to the magazine that I'm sure you all read, Gay Star Health. They write, The World Health Organization has made history and removed gender dysphoria from its list of mental disorders. Now, the World Health Organization maintains the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD. According to the newest revision, it will no longer be considered mental illness for a man to believe himself to be a woman in contravention of, you know, objective reality. And here's why the World Health Organization says it must be so. Dr. Jack Drescher a member of the ICD-11 working group wrote, quote, There is substantial evidence that the stigma associated with the intersection of transgender status and mental disorders contributes to precarious legal status and human rights violations. Well, not in the United States, not in advanced civilizations, Maybe in Iran where yoga is still outlawed. Maybe in Baghdad or someplace. Maybe in Riyadh. You know, effectively, this is a form of insanity. And now it's a human right. Maybe we can declare cancer to be a human right, and cancer will just be cured too. You know, the adulteration of the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, for a political purpose confirms that the top priority for the World Health Organization is to promote statism, progressivism, and is not to promote health. I know it's called the World Health Organization, and you would think the International Classification of Diseases would be about health, but no, it's about politics. Because if you've learned anything from listening to this podcast, it is the recognition now that politics infuses everything. I don't know where I'm going to go to dinner tonight, but you know what? I bet politics infuses dinner. Here's an example of the oppression that persons of gender dysphoriousness experience as a result of their condition having been regarded as a mental illness instead of a human right. Governments, they wrote, often require a gender disorder diagnosis as a precondition for changing transgender people's names and gender markers on official documents. Advocates have argued that diagnoses imperils basic rights like work, education, and travel. How's that? I need, I need some explaining done here. You know, at least it'll be easier to save a bundle in your car insurance because now I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to call my insurance company now and tell them that, well, I, I identify as a female. And as we know, insurance rates are lower for females than they are males. And if they, well, I, I see a big-ass lawsuit coming. Yeah, I might not have to worry about monetizing the podcast or getting back on the radio or, you know, finding a real job somewhere. Nope, I'm just going to sue my insurance company for discrimination when I tell them I've decided to identify as a female and I want my rates lowered to female rates. And they say, well, no, Mr. Brown, uh, your name's Michael. No, my, my name's still Michael, but all my friends call me Michelle. Are Mattel, are, you know, are, are the militant deviants? really happy now that pandering progressives have granted them another big win in the culture war? Of course they're not. Give a bully your lunch money. He's going to want your allowance too. And I think that in this case, the bullies are just going to continue to want more and more and more. You want some proof? Mauro Cabral Grinspan. He's the, he or she, I'm sorry, I don't know the executive director of GATE, the Global Action for Trans Equality Rights, intersex people around the world have the right not only to be protected from pathologization, I guess pathology of some sort, 
but also to have full access to reparative justice and to universal health coverage. Reparative justice? That sounds scary. Universal health care coverage is scary, too, considering how much it costs to treat horrific diseases like AIDS or cancer or anything else. Reparative justice. Yeah, figure that one out. Let me know what it means. Now, normally history is written by the winners, but these days history is being written by the losers. And I got to tell you, they're really sore losers. Listen to this story. Many advanced placement students across the fruited plain will be using an American history textbook that depicts President Trump as mentally ill and his supporters as racist. The textbook, published by Pearson Education, they're a huge publisher of textbooks, is titled By the People, A History of the United States. The final section of this book covers the, quote, angry election of 2016. In the textbook, it says, most thought that Trump was too extreme a candidate to win the nomination, but his extremism, his anti-establishment rhetoric, and some said his not very hidden racism connected with a significant number of primary voters. Now, the weasel words, and I, look, I'm a lawyer, So I have a Ph.D. in weasel words. The weasel words are some said. That's used by people when they can't support uh, what they're saying, usually because it's an out-and-out lie. The textbook continues. Clinton's supporters fear that the election had been determined by people who were afraid of a rapidly developing ethnic diversity of the country, discomfort with their candidate's gender, and nostalgia for an earlier time in the nation's history. They also worried about the mental stability of the president-elect and the anger that he and his supporters brought to the nation. I'm not sure I would call this an objective uh, view of history, but then again, you have Nancy Pelosi, who says... But the president, again, stormed out. I think, what, first... Pound the table, walk out the door. What? Next time, have the TV cameras in there while I have my say. That didn't work for him either. And now this time, another ten- temper tantrum. Uh, uh, again, I pray for the President of the United States. I wish that his family or his administration or his staff would have an intervention for the good of the country. I actually ardently pray for the president because we need I don't know sometimes when we're talking to him he's un, he, he agrees and then I, I said one time who's in charge here because you agree and then all of a sudden something changes what goes on there who's in charge uh, and he says he's in charge and I suspect that he may be and I suspect he may be even more since yesterday because I don't think that any responsible assistant to the president of the United States would have advised him to do what he did yesterday. You know, as well as I do, that if somebody's asking that, hey, I think somebody ought to have an intervention. If I were to hear that, for example, you thought my family should have an intervention with me, which of course maybe they should, but if you were saying that you thought that my family should have an intervention with me, I would read that as you saying You thought that I was mentally unstable. Now, my family already knows that, so there's no need for an intervention. But Nancy Pelosi saying that, yes, yes. So when we hear what we, or when we read what we read in these textbooks, actually the problem is with the Democrats, not with the Republicans. Speaking of collusion, and man, I hate to keep going back to collusion, but every once in a while you come across a story about collusion and obstruction of justice that I just want to go, dang it, why didn't I think about that? I have tried to explain over numerous podcasts why I do not believe from a legal point of view there was obstruction, and I have in the best layman's terms that I can try to explain that. And I think I failed miserably. 
only because having read this article in The Hill from Cheryl Atkinson, who is now an opinion contributor over at The Hill, she has her own website, she writes this. A friend of mine who is, I'll just say it, a devoted Trump hater, recently was talking about President Trump's obstruction, and I asked what I thought. After listening to his views, I told him, there's plenty about which to criticize the president, as is true of any political leader. But the obstruction charge doesn't make logical sense. So I used an analogy to explain why. When I finished, this friend still hated Trump, duh, but surprised me by saying, nobody's ever explained it that way. That makes sense. You should write about it. And so she did. And here's what Cheryl Atkinson wrote. If you were a person of some authority and murdered somebody, and prosecutors set out to investigate, and you spoke publicly against the investigation, you proclaimed your innocence, calling the probe a witch hunt, and if you worked behind the scenes to use your influence to fire the lead investigator on this murder case, that would seem to be a pretty clear case of obstruction of justice. You, as a guilty man, would be trying to stop the authorities from finding out the truth. But, she says, imagine, on the other hand, that you are an innocent man, accused of a murder that you did not commit. Not only that, imagine that you knew there was no murder to begin with because you saw the victim walking around after the supposed murder. Then, imagine you found yourself the target of the murder investigation by a team that included people who had declared you to be their sworn enemy and expressed strong desires to take you out. Then, imagine this team that included biased investigators began leaking false information to the national media to implicate you in this crime that you knew you had not committed. Now, imagine that this cloud of the murder you knew you never committed hangs over you month after month until it drags on for a couple of years. It's distracting you from your ability and authority to do the job in the public's interest. But every time you speak publicly to defend yourself and proclaim your innocence, the media and your political enemies declare you to be a liar and say that you are obstructing the investigation. It begins, she says, to look like the fix is in. Under these circumstances... You would not be human if you did not possess a desire to stop a potentially conflicted investigation by your political enemies into a crime that was never committed, least of all, a crime that was never committed by you. And since you are innocent, your attempts to stop an unfair investigation could be fairly seen as an attempt to see justice done, not to obstruct it. Bam. Cheryl Atkinson did in three or four paragraphs what I've not been able to do over the past three or four months, which is why she's Cheryl Atkinson and I'm just Michael Brown. But think about that. There was no underlying crime. You knew you were innocent because you knew you never colluded with Russia. But yet the leaks continued. It is like the murder analogy. You knew you didn't commit the murder because the person you ostensibly murdered, you still see walking around. In fact, you saw the guy walking around the day after you ostensibly committed the murder. You can't have obstruction of justice. There was no underlying crime. That's why, if there had been, if there had been an underlying crime of obstruction of justice, Bob Mueller and his team, after two-plus years and 30 plus million dollars, they would have made the recommendation that the president be indicted or at least that he be returned some sort of indictment after he leaves office on obstruction of justice. And they didn't do that. Thank you, Cheryl Atkinson, for putting that in layman's terms. Speaking of crimes, how about a couple of taxpayer relief shots? The, North one comes, the first one comes to us from North Texas. Forney, Texas. Authorities in Kaufman County are investigating after they say a homeowner shot and killed an intruder. The Kaufman County Sheriff's Office was called at 9.45 a.m. on Thursday about a burglary in progress in the 8,000 block of Farm to Market 2757 near Forney. The woman who called police said that she woke up after someone banged on her front door. She didn't answer the door because she didn't recognize the man or his vehicle. A short time later, she heard the back door being kicked in. 
So she called 911, locked herself in the closet, staying on the line with the 911 operator. While in the closet, she was confronted by the intruder. So the homeowner defended herself by shooting the suspect. When the deputies arrived on the scene, the intruder, who was not yet identified, was pronounced DRT, dead right there. The woman was not injured. How many times, how many freaking times do we hear? You don't need a gun to defend yourself. All you have to do if someone's trying to burglarize your house is go hide in the closet, dial 911, and the cops will be there, and the cops will, will somehow save you. No, in this case, that proves that's not always the case. And this woman did exactly the right thing by defending herself. The next next one comes to us from Jacksonville, Florida, where a homeowner shot and killed the intruder. West side. A man is dead after police say he tried to break into someone's home. Happened in the Argyle area about one o'clock this afternoon. I'm John Bachman. I'm Tanika Hughes. JSO says it started with a 911 call from someone claiming he shot an intruder. Action News Jacks, Lorena Inkland joins us live in the Pilgrims Trace subdivision. And Lorena, the person who allegedly fired the shot, is not under arrest. No, that person is cooperating with police and JSO just left this area about 20 minutes ago so we can give you a better view. Just behind me is where the body of the alleged intruder was found. We're not going to zoom in because just underneath that mailbox, there's a lot of blood in that area. But this is where JSO... <laughs> I love it. You know, the, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office has left. And so now we can give you a wider view of where this took place. Now, here's the mailbox. We're not going to zoom in because there's a lot of blood under the mailbox. Well, wait a minute. You just told us that you were excited because the Jackson County Sheriff's Office had left. So now you can give us a full view of everything, except you're not going to give us a full view of everything because there's blood. But you want to mention the blood because you know it. <laughs> if it bleeds, it leads. Oh concentrating their investigation. And the person who fired those shots is now talking to detectives. The intersection of Dover Cliff and Pilgrim's Trace drives became a crime scene Friday afternoon. You don't see the cops unless there's ambulances or fire trucks. This was like a shocker. It was right around 1240 p.m. when JSO says a 911 call came in from a man claiming he had shot someone who was trying to break into his home. Neighbor Ashley Robinson says she saw what appeared to be the home where it happened. Right behind us, the house, um, I drove by and you could see where the door had the whole frame was kicked into the door. JSO arrived about 10 minutes after that 911 call and found a man on the ground with at least one gunshot wound. The man, who JSO says was about 30 to 40 years old, died on the roadway. We believe it was an, an attempt of an active um, criminal act when he was shot. This was one neighbor's reaction when he heard what happened. He comes to my house, he's going to be in the doorway, that's all. He won't get through the door. Ooh, I like this old boy. You know, he comes to my house, he might be in the doorway. That's as far as he's getting with me. <laughs> I love it. Moments later, two visibly upset women pulled up. JSO spoke with them, but it's unclear how they know the people involved. It appears those women that you saw in that video may be the family of the person who was shot and killed out here today. Now, JSO tells me it does not have any knowledge that either person in this case knew each other. They're still working to figure that out. We're not showing you the home where this happened because I spoke to the family who lives there, and they tell me that they're worried for their safety. Coming up next at 6, I spoke to a neighbor who says this is not the first time he's heard of break-ins in this area. Reporting live on the... And we're going to continue this as long as we can. I like the sheriff's office saying, yep, he was engaged in some sort of criminal activity when he was shot dead. Well, that's the whole nature of the law of self-defense. If you are engaged in a criminal activity, when you put me in reasonable fear of my life, I'm allowed to exercise my God-given right of self-defense. And thus ends the uh, taxpayer relief shots for today. Those were two pretty good ones, and thanks to Agent Jed A for doing those. Over the weekend, I was reading some stories about Netflix. And it struck me that we don't really, or we haven't really paid much attention 
to the whole idea about why the Obamas were given this multi-million dollar deal to do Netflix movies. I ran across a story. Where did this, where did I find this story? This was, um, this was published back in 2014. And it says the following. In January 2013, President Obama signed into law House Resolution 6671, which amended the Video Privacy Protection Act to allow video rental companies to share rental information on social networking sites after obtaining customer permission. Netflix had lobbied for the change. Attorney Joseph H. Malley was contacted by the chief counsel of the Democrat Subcommittee on Intellectual Property at the U.S. House of Representatives to provide assistance related to the 2012 VPPA amendment proposal. So Obama signs a bill that Netflix lobbied to get a change in order to allow them to share their users' video habits with social media and vice versa. Once Obama signed that, are we to be surprised, according to Variety, it is unknown how much the Obama's Netflix agreement, which will see them produce through their newly formed company Higher Ground Productions, is worth. In March, Penguin Random House signed a couple to a joint book deal that pays them a reported $65 bucks for their respective memoirs. Barack and Michelle Obama are among the world's most, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a chuckle, most respected and highly recognized public figures and are uniquely positioned to discover and highlight stories of people who make a difference in their communities and strive to change the world for the better, said Netflix Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos. Quote, we are incredibly proud they have chosen to make Netflix the home for their formidable storytelling abilities. This is how politicians come into office as church mice, barely worth the amount they've been able to save over a few years of scratching some pennies here and there. And they leave multimillionaires. This is the crony capitalism that drives me nuts. I don't care whether or not this piece of legislation was a good piece of legislation or a bad piece of legislation. But let's just say that it's a good piece of legislation that Netflix really needed for some reason. I don't care whether the Obamas are making $10 million, $20 million, or the reported $100 million for this Netflix proposal. Don't you think that that $100 million that Netflix is now paying them is a token amount considering that now Netflix can share viewers' viewing habits, their subscribers' viewing habits with Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or anybody else? What a cheap price to pay to get the President of the United States, Barack Obama, to sign a piece of legislation that you've been lobbying for, that you pushed through Congress, and you finally got Congress to pass it, all you needed was the president's signature. And for that, you paid, again, I don't care, $10 million, $100 million, doesn't make any difference. It's a small price to pay for, under our system of crony capitalism, for these politicians to get rich. I don't think, I don't think it smells right. I think it stinks to high heaven. And we've somehow got to get away from politicians being able to do insider trading, being able to trade on what they know is going to pass or not pass, or even worse, in the case of the Obamas, being able to, oh, there's no quid pro quo here. Really? You signed a bill in 2013, and in 2016, when you leave office, you get a deal worth a purported I don't care, 50 or $100 million. Doesn't make any difference to me what the dollar amount is. You got the deal because you signed the piece of legislation. There's just something wrong about that. Utterly wrong. And last but not least, the Washington Free Beacon just broke with a story that says, the headline, 
special counsel spokesman Bob Mueller never drafted indictment of Trump. Now, this has to do with a book that's been written, and there are some galley copies floating around, and The Guardian, the U.K. newspaper, apparently has gotten its hands on some of the galley proofs. The book is called Fire and Fury, and the author is Michael Wolf. And in his book, he is said to claim that Bob Mueller drafted an indictment of President Trump during the Russian investigation. According to an early copy of the book, titled Siege, Trump Under Fire, obtained by The Guardian, Wolf writes that Mueller drew up an indictment of Trump that named three counts of, of obstruction of justice. And then, Wolf writes, the document sat on Mueller's desk for a full year before the special counsel decided not to press the issue. Wolf claims his findings are based, quote, on internal documents given to me by sources close to to the Office of Special Counsel. Now, before I tell you what the Office of Special Counsel has said in retort to this claim, remember, the Office of Special Counsel, headed by Bob Mueller, over his two years of investigation, had virtually, in fact, I would say, literally, no leaks whatsoever. And the only time they have come out and said anything publicly is to deny stories that they see in the press that are flat-ass wrong. So Mueller's spokesman, Peter Carr, flatly denies the claim, saying, quote, the documents that you've described do not exist. So that's pretty quick to come out and deny crazy Michael Wolf claims. Interestingly, the Mueller group, have not denied any of Attorney General Bill Barr's claims. You know, that should tell the crazy folks on the left something. Give it a rest. Just give it a rest. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Brown Unplugged Podcast. I'll make this real quick. Go to michaelbrowntoday.com. There you'll find all the social media icons where you can follow me on all my social media platforms. And you can now subscribe to us on iTunes. Just simply go to iTunes, search for Michael Brown Unplugged, click the subscription button, leave us a five-star review if you're so inclined, and write a view if you've got the time. MichaelBrownToday.com or follow us on iTunes. And I'll talk to you tomorrow.